We are living in a very difficult moment in the world. You recovering from the ravages of COVID-19. <clears throat> we are faced with high inflation, high food and energy costs, a war in Ukraine, the danger of a war between the United States and China, and the risk that we may be about to see a new Cold War with China and Russia on one side and the West on the other. <clears throat> I want to ask you to, for a moment, take your eyes and your minds away from those <clears throat> pressing problems and focus instead on the health of the planet. The Earth is our only home, <clears throat> and there's no planet B we can relocate to. The planet is simultaneously faced with three crises. Global warming climate change, the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem, and the degradation of our ocean. At COP26 in Glasgow last year, the mood was very positive. The delegates reaffirmed their commitment <clears throat> to cap the rise of global temperature at below 1.5 degrees Celsius. I'm afraid that the war in Ukraine and the energy crunch have destroyed or optimism. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has recently reported that it saw no clear path to achieving 1.5 degrees Celsius. In a few days, we will meet Jamal Sheikh, Egypt, for COP27. Hope it will be a successful meeting, but I'm not up there. <clears throat> In the meantime, the polar caps and glaciers are melting. I just shared with you one number that will shock you. From the year 2000 to 2019, period of 19 years, the world's glaciers shed more than 5.3 trillion tons of water. One consequence of this, the rise of sea level, which, as you all know, poses an existential threat to many low-lying cities and countries, including Singapore. Some low-lying countries, like the Maldives, which many Singaporeans love to go to, will completely disappear. We are also likely to see the intensification of extreme weather, weather conditions, such as the recent flood in Pakistan and Bangladesh, the drought and famine in Somalia, <clears throat> and forest fires in Europe and America. These are precursors of worse things to come. The loss of biodiversity and ecosystems, degradation of our oceans, and global warming climate change pose a serious threat and its capacity to sustain human civilization. We want a healthy people in a healthy planet. And if the planet becomes unhealthy, the people will suffer. I'm a prophet of hope, not a prophet of despair. So I want to share with you my, my optimism that it is not too late to think, turn things around. I believe that it is not too late for us to learn to be good stewards of our natural environment. What should we do? I suggest we should do four things. First, we as individuals should change our behavior and take ownership of the problems we have created. My impressions is that 
young Singaporeans get it and they want to do the right thing. I'm not sure about the older Singaporean. Second, we need good policies by government to incentivize individuals and business to do the right thing. Carbon tax is an example of good policy. The decision to phase out non-electric vehicles by 2040 is another example. I urge the Singapore government to follow the good examples of France and Japan and make it mandatory to set our thermostat at 25 degrees Celsius in our office buildings, in hotels like this, and in other public amenities. Third, <clears throat> we need international agreements, which we have. We have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Paris Agreement, we have the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. We have the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Fourth, we need technological innovation. Technology can help us solve many of our problems. For example, solar energy today is cheaper than energy generated by oil and gas. Singapore is planning to import clean energy from Laos. We are also planning to import solar energy from the neighboring countries. And hydrogen is a possible game changer. So, so I want to conclude, uh, Selma, on a note of optimism, to say the situation is very grave, but I believe it's still possible for us to turn things around. You know, you draw a very bleak picture, but you speak of hope. I really applaud you. But realistically speaking, you know, in spite of the four steps you mentioned, what is the best we can hope for? Can any of the damage that is already there be reversed? How were you able to maintain your hope in the darkest days of apartheid? And he replied, I'm a prisoner of hope. I'm not a prisoner of hope, but I'm a born optimist. Let's take Singapore as an example. The government has announced that we will peak our emission at, in the year 2030, which is not very far away. And from 2030, we will gradually reduce our emission until we become net zero in 2050. Many countries in the world have similarly pledged to achieve net zero by 2050. Of course, some of the bigger countries, China has pledged to achieve net zero in 2060 and India 2070. So we are, we are moving in the right trajectory. We will do a lot of damage to the planet in the meantime, but nature is extremely resilient. You know, given a chance, nature will recover. Look at Singapore. A few years ago, we thought the hornbill bird was extinct. Now there are so many hornbill birds in Singapore. There are, there's so many jungle fowl running around. Um, I, I'm, I'm impressed that no Singaporean killed them for chicken rice. <laughs> and, and you know, the wild boars have come back to us. Otters have come back. So my point is nature is resilient. You give it a chance, it will recover. You know? Thank you, Tommy. And I hope uh, you know, what you say will come true because we are all living in this world and we really need it to be a good place to live in. Now, let's turn to the pandemic where uh, Lin Fa is obviously the expert here. You know, more than six and a half million people have already died from COVID and now they say that uh, it's endemic, which means it will continue to circulate and it will continue to kill, right? Unfortunately, people, the experts are saying that pandemics will probably emerge with greater frequency uh, you know, there's fear that with climate change, global warming, uh, zoonotic diseases will increasingly move from beast to man. And similarly, as the polar ice caps um, melt, they may also release long extinct bugs into the ecosystem. So what can we do to protect against such threats? Yeah, that's a billion dollar question. <laughs> So I think maybe set the scene is that for our Professor uh, Coe's comments that uh, our race pandemic as one of the
great security threats. So traditional people like myself, and we're always thinking of it's a health issue, you know, disease, you know. But I think now after COVID, I think uh, we all realize we have to raise at the security level. It's a national and international security. So Prof. Go basically painted the picture of the you know the climate change, the ocean, the diversity. But I will put in insert the war, right? The military war is still a risk, and we are having one right now. And then before pandemic, the SARS you know uh, pandemic was uh, in our zone, terrorists fighting terrorists also was uh, very difficult. So now you put all of this, I think it's very hard for me to measure which one is more dangerous. But I can tell you which one is the most difficult to predict and to prevent. That's pandemics. Why? Because climate change, we already know what drives it, whether you agree or disagree, and we know what to do to prevent it. So it's the political will and the investment. Terrorists is the, the war, I think, is also nowadays. In modern wars, uh, you cannot start a war without you know, giving hints. So you can actually, if not predict, but actually you can really sort of detect that and you can do something about it. Terrorists is the same thing. 911 was the one I think uh, really difficult. But after that, you know, I think uh, I like to quote to you know, Donald Rumsfeld, you know, the then uh, Defense Secretary of US. Really, after 911, he defined the scenario as the three different categories the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Okay, so for terrorists now, we have this, you know, the electronic AI monitoring so that most of them that we can monitor the so called background chatters. Now you come to pandemics. Equally, we have the known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Now, to detect the, the known unknowns and unknown unknowns for a viral activity, it's much more difficult than any of the previous risks. So in terms of risk, in terms of for how to prevent, how to predict, it's very difficult. So your question is, how can we do it, right? So, you know, science and the technology comes in. So there are three levels, you know, we try to do. And Singapore, I'm very proud to say, it's leading the world is to put in funding and they try to raise the alertness. Three levels. The idea level, what we call is predict and prevent. Now that need a lot of investment, really try to do the equivalent of the terrorist background chatters. We know there are a lot of virus circulating, especially bats, you know, that's what I, you know, I was introduced at the Batman. I've been doing bat bomb virus for the last 30 years. Lots of virus circulating in bats, especially in our region. And many of them are ready to jump. Mm -hmm. So now we need a lot of investment, technology, and a political will to do the surveillance and the detection before they jump to human. And we try to prevent that. That's still a very high bar. Okay? And in Singapore, we don't have enough wildlife, so that's not our focus. The second one is what we call early detection and mitigation. So that we can do use technology in hospitals and in borders, you know, like Changi Airport, if we do a surveillance, we can have early warnings. And once we have early warnings and with the international collaboration, we can really at least mitigate. You know, I always say, go back to December 2019 in Wuhan. If the international world was working together and we had an early science, but we were not taking it seriously. If we took it seriously, we may not need to come to today. Actually, the world, uh, you know, we, it was quite fast, actually, between December uh, 2019 and January when uh, I think WHO already uh, looked into the things. So it wasn't a very long time. And in spite of that, the virus ran around the world. Yes, I mean, but the first few, the first months, basically, I mean, in... In our field, we always say, you know, uh, in politics, people say a week, week is a long time. In pandemic preparedness, it's the same. One week will make a big difference, right? One so week. one week, yeah. So we know already the first now retrospectively confirmed human cases of COVID-19 was December 2nd, December. 2019. But the world really did not know or take action until early January, middle January. So we, you know, we were four to five weeks behind. So the third line of defense, that's what uh, you know, uh, most people we try to do is we call the countermeasures, the vaccine the therapeutics. So the vaccine for COVID-19 
is historical, right? From the first detection of the virus in the sequence to a mRNA vaccine in our arm, it's 10 months. Basically, that's kind of, a, you know, really uh, uh, historical, but we're still here in the middle of the pandemic. So I always say we need to do all three, uh, prediction, prevention, early warning, mitigation, and a countermeasure of the vaccine therapeutics. But I think uh, realistically, the second part is the most important, early detection and the mitigation. And that needs a lot of political will because we have a cliche that says, virus recognize no borders. And I always add, bats recognize no borders either. So unless the international community work together and being totally transparent and do not play the blame game, the culture has to change. Say, we're fighting the common animal or enemies. No matter where the virus starts, we should work together. So I think that, that really will be the future and we're working. In Singapore, you know, we have this new yeah. pandemic preparedness program and I have the privilege of leading the national effort, but we know already that Singapore alone will not be able to do it. So we're working very closely with regional and international agencies. Limpa, I'm gonna come back to you on bats, but before we do that, for COVID-19, we are lucky that it actually emerged in China because China is pretty advanced. Yeah. If it had emerged in say, um, a rural environment, third world country, et cetera, we may not even be able to catch it until it's been spreading for months. Certainly, I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tragedy without any doubt, but we were lucky in two sort of a respect. One is that in Wuhan, you know, Wuhan happened to have the most advanced the Institute of Virology, so they were able to solve the genome sequencing in five days and link it to bats within, you know, a few, a week. Secondly is the timing. You know, I have worked on SARS-1 in 2002, 2003, and the SARS-2 in 2019. Imagine if we reverse these two events. If we had a SARS-2 in 2002, our technological sort of capability is nowhere near that. So not only China was able to detect and publish the sequence of the genome in five days, but also the vaccine. So I just gave you the numbers, right? Five days from the, the sample arrived and they have the genome sequence and they put on the international site to share. And from there on day one, you know, Moderna, Pfizer will already go into a vaccine development. 17 years ago for SARS-1, that was five months. It took a scientist to know what's going on. The a typical pneumonia in Guangdong and the later called the SARS, we still did not know what kills human. So that was five months, okay? So if we had a SARS-CoV-2, you know, in 2002, 2003, six, five million people were time at least 10 have to die. So we were really lucky that SARS came in that particular order. That's right. right. And the reason SARS-1 wasn't so bad was because it didn't spread as easily. Two reasons. One is that the transmission is not as bad as SARS-CoV-2. Secondly, I always say is the severity of disease. So it's a 10% case fatality and it's almost 100% severe pneumonia. Now, that's bad for whoever got the SARS-1 because you have 10% chance of dying and also you got very sick. But as a society, in terms of public health pandemic control, it's much easier because you can identify this and you can quality them. So there's two reasons, less transmissible and all severe. Right. You know, I want to come back to bats because uh, a lot of the emerging infectious diseases were transmitted from bats. I think you were talking about the Hendra virus yeah, from yeah. bats to uh, horses and then humans, uh, bats to pigs and then humans, etc. So may I ask a very simplistic question? Can't we just get rid of all the bats? Will that solve our problem? Well, that's a totally against what Professor Goh was saying, right? We need to maintain the biodiversity and the, the, the natural environment. But more importantly, I mean, I don't know how many of you know, in the ecosystem, bats are very important to play a role. First of all, insect control. If we get rid of the bats, I think we have more disease rather than less. And secondly, you know, the, the uh, uh, seeds dispersion and the pollination. So the biodiversity, we need the bats. Without bat, the bat obviously would be killed. So practically and also scientifically, not possible. But I'm going to put a plug, you know, into it because uh, 
my research find the all the virus from bats, but I always say that's not bats' fault; it's humans' fault. So I'm going to really, you know, uh, to, to can say you, can something. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's not a bat's fault. Yeah, humans. bats are much older. Bats coexist with dinosaur. They were on the earth long before humans, so they have been co-live with the viruses for millions, millions of years. It's the human activity in the last few decades which really triggered the spillover. But there's another thing very important. You know, I was talking to a, a, a Prof. Go before the session. I was very proud to win a large grant in Singapore. The government supported me to do bat research. You know, what's the title of the grant? Learning from bats. Bats are the most healthy mammals on Earth. They live long, don't suffer cancer, don't suffer diabetes, don't suffer, you know, uh, heart disease, don't suffer uh, autoimmune disease. So we have a major program, you know, we were the pioneer as the Batman, but internationally now, a lot of people are going to using bats as a model system to learn the lessons. And I think somebody was saying the session before that to, to try to live to 120 years, you know, if we can learn from bats, the bat equivalent of human years, they are thousand years old, right? A dog, you know, one year is seven years of human. This is boy, the size. A bat is a seven gram. I can hold it in my, you know, uh, hand. So that bat can live 43 human years. If you multiply by 30, that's a thousand year old human. Right. So bats are here to stay. Without any doubt. <laughs> you know, before, before this session, Tommy and Ninfa and I were talking about technology. Tommy was very gung-ho that technology can help us uh, solve our climate uh, problems. Linfo, on the other hand, says uh, in terms of pandemic, technology is not going to do more than maybe 50%. So let's see why the two professors have such diverse opinions. Tommy, would you like no, to say... We're, we're, not, we're not in disagreement, you know. Technology itself cannot solve the problem. But technology can help to solve the problem. You think climate change and global warming. Um, technology is helping us to be more efficient in the use of energy. Technology is helping us to harness energy, not from oil and gas, but from, from the sun, from wind, from the waves. Um, technology is helping us to, to, um, to really evolve a game-changing new source of energy, hydrogen. You know? So these are ways in which technology can help us to solve the problem. But at the end of the day, it's a combination of technology and human policy and human behavior. Right. And so we're not in disagreement. I don't think we're in disagreement because my comment, you know, made was in a very narrow context of pandemic, fighting pandemic, especially after COVID-19. I have to say, you know, I was on the WHO mission in 2003, went to China, worked with scientists from USA, France, Japan, you know, Australia, to identify the origin of SARS-1. So that was the good old days, totally apolitical. We focused on science and the public health, and eventually I let the international team discover it originated from the bats in Yunnan province in southern China. The Chinese government was totally okay. They opened the doors to the military research institute, and we have Americans, French, Australians on it. But fast forward, by 2019, you know, the world geopolitics was already bad, and then COVID exacerbated that. So now what I'm saying is that to prevent the next pandemic, science and the technology is 50% or less. The political will and the international transparency, collaboration. The other thing is the legal framework. You know, we were discussing about the role of WHO. You know, I was sitting on the WHO committee from day one in January 2020. But WHO is a consensus organization. What we think is the best for international experts to gather and go to a country, if the country says no, we cannot do anything. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, personally I have been working in this field for the last 30 years, and from SARS-1 to SARS-2, the technology has advanced so much, but the geopolitics was going backwards. So that's what I said, in this yeah. field, for the future success, Technology is only half. The other half is the non-technology yeah. aspect. And uh, we need a, people like Professor Go and others on the international you know, stage to really yeah. 
to express that view and for all the politicians to realize that, you know, we're fighting a common enemy, right? It's a virus. So I think it's very important that technology is uh, only half and the other half we have to come from the political will. I agree right. with that, 100% I agree. Yeah. Right, you know, uh, in fighting COVID-19, there was a lot of cooperation, although there was also a lot of selfishness on the part of some countries. But looking just at the cooperation, you know, as uh, you say, there was the coming out with the vaccines, you know, there's so many vaccines now available, the sharing of data, the genome sequence, etc. Tommy, could I ask you, are there lessons from the cooperation we just saw over the past two years that can be used in our fight against climate change? Well, but we are, we are doing that. Uh, the countries of the world, which are parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, they meet every, every year. It, the meeting called COP. COP means Conference of Parties, you know. So they, they meet every year. They, they are cooperating with each other. Uh, I think the Paris Agreement 2015 was a breakthrough because there was no agreement until 2015 on whether all countries should share the burden or should the burden be imposed exclusively on the developed country. And the reason the American re rejected the Kyoto Protocol was that in the Kyoto Protocol, the developing countries were exempted from burden sharing. You know? So under the Paris Agreement, all countries big and small, rich and poor, can make a contribution. And we, we all make unilateral declaration of what we're willing to contribute. Unfortunately, the progress has not been as fast as a lot of people wanted, especially the younger people who see the world that they live in, the world they're going to grow up in, you know, uh, being destroyed by the older generation. Yes. What well, advice would you give these younger people? No, I, I think the younger people uh, hope for the future. No? I mean, I look at the students in Singapore. They get it about climate change. And they want us to move faster in taking remedial action. The problem is the older people. You know, and it, it is really sh shocking to me that in the most scientifically advanced country, the United States, you elected somebody called Donald Trump who believed that climate change was a hoax invented by China to fool Americans. And there are many small Donald Trumps, including the current president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, you know? So it, it's amazing to me that in this day and age, when the facts are clear, the science are clear, and yet for ideological reason, there are grown-ups who reject facts and reject science. Our hope are the young people. The young people will try. May I add on the point, you know, just to follow Professor School, I think uh, that's kind of the, 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 the political sort of, uh, 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 you know, fighting is one thing. But I think to be fair, the difference between pandemic and the climate change is this uh, fear of the crisis and the life and the death. So pandemic, I always say it's like a war, you know, as soon as the virus is spread killing people, I mean, just, uh, you know, the United Nations, the, the, the climate change, you know, it's an annual conference. For pandemics, I work for WHO, we have weekly conference. We, the collaboration, exchange, the scientists all over the world, invite the speakers, but open to the whole public. Very easily, and the, thanks to Zoom, you know, the silver lining of COVID is Zoom. So we very, very often to have a meeting that, uh, you know, maybe 10 people speaking, but 10,000 people in attendance. So that's very important for the, pub, the politicians, the public policy, you know, uh, 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 policymakers, scientists, even lay, you know, audience can join that. So the urgency, I think, that the to win the war in the climate change is to educate, teach the next generation. It's the life and the death, basically. If you don't do that, right? So that's the difficult part. With the COVID, you don't need to do that. People surrounding you are dying. Die. So in other words, you get to, you have to frighten people for action to be fast and uh, global. That's how do we do? How do we translate that to climate change? How do you get people scared enough to say, if I don't do something this year, I may not see next year? Well, I think all these extreme weather events are helping um, people to realize that it's not a future problem, but a present problem. Um, the devastating floods, the famine and drought, the 
forest fire. I think these are these are waking people up and say, hey, it it it's a present problem, it's not a future problem. And if we don't do something to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases, things will get worse. Right. You know, there's a question from the audience here that says, Prof Ko, you mentioned we should focus on the health of the planet. How do we get Singaporeans to shift their hyperfixation from elevating their social and economic status to this instead? Because people are so busy trying uh, to improve their own uh, yeah. wealth, status, etc. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what's more important than to ensure the planet's capacity to continue to sustain human life. If we make the planet uninhabitable, what, what do you do with your millions or billions of dollars? Yes, but most people, unfortunately, will say, why do I have to make the sacrifice? Why aren't you making the sacrifice? Well, that, this is why I think, for example, we are all wearing jackets, sweaters, because the room is over air conditioned. <laughs> this morning, I chaired a meeting in a, in a bank and it was freezing cold. Why doesn't the Singapore government have the courage to follow the good example of France, Japan, and other countries and make it mandatory to set your thermostat at 25 degrees? How much difference would that actually make? It will make a difference. It will make a difference. And there's a question for uh, Lin Fa. It says, in your opinion, what could disease X be like? Yeah, so this is a kind of a, a crystal ball thing we always get. So actually now, WHO and uh, you know uh, Gates um, on the committee. So we actually have a committee now to ranking the risk of the current known viruses, and they potentially become a disease X. So the top three are the flu, influenza virus, and the coronavirus. The so coronavirus we already had a SARS one, SARS two, and a MERS. So you know, people like myself is prepared for SARS three, SARS four. It's a matter of time. The other, the other class of virus we call the, the paramiso virus. Are you uh, familiar with measles virus? You know, the measles is the most transmissible virus in mankind's history, period. Measles, measles. Now measles. we have a vaccine, we can uh, prevent it. But that class of virus is still circulating. So the hangover virus are working in Australia, the nipple virus in our neighbor in Malaysia, and I killed uh, you know, more than 100 people and uh, some, one of the Singaporean died and also in India, Bangladesh right now. So these are the third class of viruses, you know. But as a scientist, you know, you can predict, but the nature always wins, right? So we can predict as much as we can, but at least these are the three top of family of virus we are close to monitoring. After learning the lesson from COVID, the international community, so that's a positive out of COVID, we're gonna to work together, raise billions of funds, to do preemptive vaccine development. So the scientists like myself, we come together to say in the virus, in the animal, we know that all existing, what's the likely to jump? And we rank them one to 20, and the top 20, we're going to develop vaccine before they jump. Who's going to pay for that development because the virus may never jump or may not jump in your lifetime? Just like the climate change, you know, it's, it's a global issue so that you have to do global contribution. So, there are organizations like SEPI, you know, Singapore is contributing as well. But of course, the Gates, the welcome, the big funders, you know, and then the uh, US NIH is going to put a lot of money in as well. You know, this raises a question. You say that there are three classes of uh, viruses that are likely to be the disease X. What happens if you have a new class four? So you're preparing for one, two, three. You've got everything in place, uh, you know, your vaccine preparations and all that. And then something totally new comes. That's what a... Uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, defined as unknown unknowns. For unknown unknowns, whether you are a terrorist or you are a virus, our current technology will not be able to predict, so we cannot do too much. So we, all we can do is early detection and response. We cannot predict. So yes, science, as I said, you know, even in 2022, science is still limited. Tommy, did you want to add to that? You said no. Right, so there's another question. Uh, it says, Prof. Ko, what is your take on this? Will we as a world population be able to work on climate change while armed conflicts are still ongoing? Uh, well, the war, the Russian war against Ukraine has, as, as I said, you know, raised energy prices, 
raise food prices, it destroyed the optimism that we had in Glasgow last year. So if there are more armed conflicts, or I mean, can you imagine if there were a war between the United States and China over Taiwan? This will be a disaster, not just for the, those two countries, but for the whole world, you know? So, so I think we must determine to prevent war. But and, the current and we, must, we must also try to prevent a new Cold War between China and Russia on the one side and the West on the other. I, I fear this may, may come about. When I look at the sign today, I am very worried. Yeah. So have our climate change uh, efforts been set back as a result? And by how, how much are we talking about? <laughs> I can't answer that question, but for sure it's been set back. You know, Linpa, earlier you were talking about the different viruses and you mentioned a uh, known unknown. What, are, what is a known unknown? Okay, so very good example, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. SARS-1, 2002, when it jumped, you know, for people like me, you know, we have been working in virology for decades. We never knew that a coronavirus from that family can cause such a severe disease with, with 10% mortality. Mm -hmm. So... These are unknown unknowns. We would not have predicted coronavirus will cause a disease like that. But after SARS-1, we had the most coronavirus in Middle East, right? That had a case fatality of 30%, although not as transmissible. Yes. And so we already know, you know, these are the known unknowns to say within the coronavirus family, there are virus ready to jump when they jump they can cause severe disease. The case fatality can vary from 10 to 30%, but they largely are not very transmissible, okay? Then we had a COVID. So COVID, the case fatality dropped to 2%. You think 2% is not much, but if it's on you, it's 100%. But the really scary thing is now this transmissibility. I said measles virus is the most transmissible among mankind. And now COVID-19 is beating everybody else. They're beating influenza virus. So it's always the transmissibility plus the case fatality. You have to look at both. So now I think that's what I said I'm really worried about. So, you know, in Singapore, we're trying to develop this broader preemptive uh, vaccine so that it will be ready for SARS-3, SARS-4. As I said, it's only a matter of time that Street Times was the one, you know, in 2013, they interviewed me after most coronavirus. And, uh, you know, the journalist was pushing really hard to say, you keep saying there will be another virus. Can you give a time? You know, so I was uh, very kind of brave to predict to say in the next 10 years, that's what 2013, I said the next 10 years, there will be another killer virus jumping out of bats. But I don't know when and where uh, it's 2019. So it's actually six years. You know? so, so you were proven right. So are you willing to make another prediction? No, it's sad. You know, you might, uh, and as a scientist, if you prove your hypothesis right, you should be celebrating and should be recognized that. But in my field, if I prove my hypothesis right, people have to die. You know? So that's the thing. I, I don't want to make another prediction in this uh, forum. You know, can I just come back to the fact that I think there are about seven coronavirus uh, types right now that have, some of them are just a common cold type of uh, yes. coronavirus. Is it possible to come up with a vaccine to prevent any future coronavirus from infecting us prophylactically? That, that's what I'm doing. So I have a company now, you know, so it's a Singapore invention, Singapore company. So, but it's, it's not going to be an easy task. You know, I always say, you know, there's an analogy of the digital revolution, right? The mobile phones we're having is 5G. But remember, we did not have a mobile phone and we have 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G and we're now go to 6G. In coronavirus vaccine development, what we got in our arm is 1G, the first generation, mm. specifically direct against the Wuhan virus. Now, the Singapore government just approved the bivariant. Bi so this is uh, the, Singap uh, the, the Wuhan virus plus the BF1. So this is the 2G, 2G. second generation, specific for the variants. I'm developing what we call a surgery. There is a subfamily of virus called the SARS, like a beta coronavirus. So there's SARS-1 and SARS-2 is there. So we have now preliminary data. We can do a booster for you guys. You already have the SARS-2 vaccine. If we give you another booster, 
then you will be protected against all the subgenus virus we call 3G, third generation vaccine. There are scientists much more ambitious and there's already funding for it to go to the next level, the fourth generation, and then the fifth generation is every coronavirus on Earth. So scientifically, I think it's very really challenge, but I think uh, my 3G, I already have data, so I'm more confident. But for the 4G and the 5G, there are people working on it. But what about the other two classes of viruses? So the flu virus, which we currently have to get annual jab. Yes. So obviously, you know, it has no long lasting protection. And yeah. then the measles. Yeah, so the universal flu virus has been a dream of our mankind. And the scientists have been working on this for 50 years. Actually, it's the coronavirus now boosted the uh, uh, confidence that that's maybe possible. I always uh, half jokingly to say, whoever develop a universal flu vaccine, worth two Nobel Prize. One for the science, one for the impact. So, so hopefully you know, in our lifetime, we'll see that happening. And then for the other virus, you know, the Hanjo Nipper viruses, it's actually a little bit easier. This virus does not change as much as coronavirus the flu. So I think uh, if the needs are there, I think I'm more confident to, to produce. You know, I produce a vaccine in Australia against the Hanjo virus which is 100% effective against the Nipah virus in Malaysia and in Bangladesh. So we have a mini universal vaccine already in the small kind of a, a branch, and we're trying to work towards a, a more broad. Yeah, so that one is actually our most confident. The influenza and the coronavirus are the challenging ones because the virus mutates so fast. Right, there's a question there for both. Uh, it says, what's the best case scenario for the future and the worst case? Tommy, would you like to take that first? Uh, the best case scenario is that um, the leaders of the world and the peoples of the world will actually get together and substantially reduce our greenhouse gas emission before 2030. And we will, we will arrive at net zero even before 2050. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that we continue to mess up. You know, <laughs> we continue to mess up. And, and we, will, we will have global temperature rising by 2 or 3 degrees mm -hmm. and, and it will really have devastating impact on agriculture, on human beings, on, on the animals. You know. So will all these science fiction stories you know, about uh, the end of the world, Armageddon, uh, is that part of the worst case scenario? It, it's one of the possible scenarios. Linfo? Oh, it's very, very hard to, <laughs> to, to go there, right? In the worst scenario, we all know, you know, you know so if the nuclear thing goes, then the, you know, the, the, the mankind will be really uh, uh, in big trouble. The best scenario, I think, uh, is that uh, uh, for future generation politicians, hopefully the young people in the audience, you know, I have been mentoring my scientists to say that, you know, my career really tells me to say science and technology is important but you have to be able to speak up the opinion to influence the politician. So either you become politician or you actively engage politician. At the end of the day, politicians make the decisions, right? So that's, I think, uh, hopefully the new generation of uh, scientists, you know, bankers, uh, doctors, lawyers, hopefully not only look at uh, your narrow sort of speciality, but uh, try to influence the society. And nowadays, actually, it's not that difficult to do. I mean, the previous session talking about the social media. So as an individual, you know, if you actively engage, you can do that. Thank you. Now we have got less than three minutes. So I'm just going to ask Prof Ko and uh, Prof Wang, any last words you want to say? Any last messages? Tommy? Yeah, I, 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 want, to, I want to end on an optimistic note. Um, I... I will say that we have only one Earth and due to our past activity, we messed up the world. We have produced global warming climate change. We have, we have um, decimated biodiversity ecosystem. We are degrading the ocean. But as an optimist, I believe it's not too late and that we can turn things around. And we, especially young people, can learn to be good stewards of our planet. Thank you, Tommy. Linfa, anything? Yeah, so I think uh, that 
you know, my experience of doing bat research taught me a lot of lessons. We have been focused on human and mouse for too long. So if you go a little bit out of your comfort zone, you get a lot of new knowledge. I think in the last session, you know, talking about, you know, uh, 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 develop AI to understand the languages of the plants and animals. If you can understand the bat language, I think the world will be a much better place, you know, because they know how to keep them healthy. So that's really, I think it's not a joke. I think that there's a lot to be learned from wildlife and then their behavior, you know, and uh, the second, I think if I may to add a second point is that, uh, as I said, forum like this, I really enjoy, you know, listen to people outside your field. I think it's so important for the modern society is that uh, don't focus only on your expertise area. Thank you. Right, so go outside your comfort zone. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lin Fa. Tommy, you have given us a lot of food for thought. Ladies and gentlemen, do uh, join me in thanking Professor Wang Lin Fa and Professor Tommy Ko for their insightful views. Thank you, thank you.